much, Sarah. Uh, morning, everybody. I appreciate your time and your interest in the topic. All right. Uh, with that, I guess, kind of introduction, uh, let's get over the objectives we'll improvise today. So a few words about me so you know who is talking in front of you. I'm Associate Professor of Pharmacogenomics with NC State University. Originally, I come from Eastern Europe, Ukraine, small village in the mountains, 5,000 people, middle of nowhere, nothing ever, ever changed it, which means we use botanicals for every health outcome. Uh, I was growing up in that area. I'm excited about it. I spent my career working with botanicals and human health. Uh, I received my PhD from Rutgers University in New Jersey, 30 miles away from here. And then I moved to North Carolina to, for a tenure position with the university. I also spent some time with NIH Botanical Center, and I run my own mobile discovery program, finding new bioactives from nature. All right? But before we start the talk today, right, I have a couple of questions for you before you start asking me. Uh, so the first question for the audience is, Cannabis has been legal for personal use in, and I'll give you two choices, all right? So the first one is Alaska, and the second one is North Korea. So who thinks it's Alaska? Okay, I have one hand. Who thinks it's North Korea? Wow, there are a lot of hands. Well, it's legal for personal use in both places. Interesting fact, right? Uh, one more quiz before we get serious. The first US state to ban cannabis 100 years ago was New York, California, or North Carolina? You're right. It was California. How ironic, right? Uh, OK. So we are talking about cannabis, right? The plant pretty much evolved together with the human as we populated the Earth. The biogeographic distribution of the plant, the place where it is mostly diverse is found in Central Asia. And it is widely believed right now that it was the people of Yamna culture, and you see that face, I mean, it really looks like it. They were the people who actually trafficked cannabis both to the west, to the Europe, and to the east, to Southeast, China, Southeast Asia and China. And that's how people got in touch with cannabis, and that's how they develop the use of this plant for many purposes, right? Historically, we don't use it only for recreation. We use it for fiber, we use it for food, we use it for oil, we use it for so many other things, right? But obviously the important one is fun. Uh, it is believed to be exactly the same plant, right? Some people argue there are three different species, some people argue there are four different species, some people say no, there are five different chemotypes, but basically all these plants have the capability to cross into each other, which means even if there are different species, they are very closely related, right? So the way we define cannabis into two major groups, marijuana, which is legal in many places, and hemp, which is perfectly legal as of December last year, is based on the major cannabinoid that they are producing and the amount of it present in the plant. Marijuana has very high level of THCs, and over time we bred the plant to have more and more THC. so nowadays strains are extremely potent. And hemp is the plant that has low level of THC. It's still there, but present in small quantities. And high amounts of another cannabinoid, which is called CBD, right? The difference between the two is minute. If you look here, this ring is closed in THC and it's open in CBD, that's all. That's the only difference between the two molecules, but they're completely different when you look at the pharmacological and health benefits that these molecules create. Uh, as I mentioned already, it was used for many different purposes throughout time. And the interesting thing is that cannabinoids, we think of hemp plant as the one that's producing cannabinoids, right? It's very smart about it. It produces it mostly in trichomes. And trichomes, these are these little structures, I don't know if you see it very well here, but basically, these are little glandular structures. Let me just increase it a little bit more for you. And let me make it even bigger, which has the secretary cells at the base of it and the big sac on top. So these are the cells which are responsible for the producing of cannabinoids. And they all accumulate in this space, and they are released from the plant surface whenever it's needed. Whenever the plant is damaged, whenever the plant is uh, suspect to any kind of microbial or insect warfare, 
or whenever we touch the plant, whenever we heat the plant, these compounds, basically trichomes are being broken off and the cannabinoids are released and serve the purpose to defend the plant. The plant doesn't care about us. Uh, how many of you actually know how many cannabinoids are in the plant? Any numbers? Right, so, so, so you, you, you look at the literature, you'll see 60, 100, 120, 150, and the numbers go on and go on and go on, right? Well, most of them are found in very insignificant amounts. So you can forget pretty much about everything except for the few major ones. And I'll give you a very quick primer so you know exactly how plant is making cannabinoids, <coughs> right? So the plant starts with CBG A. A stands for acid. All cannabinoids, or most of them, which are present in the plant, are produced and stored in the acid form. These compounds are more soluble, so it's for the plant it's easier to produce it, to secrete it, and to keep it in a sack, right? And only when the plant is damaged, or heated by some people, these compounds are transformed from the acid form in their active form that we know as cannabinoids, right? So there are three different enzymes which basically take CBG acid and convert it into THC acid, CBD acid, or CBC acid. And these four compounds are then basically, you remove the carboxy group, you remove the acid part of the molecule, uh, you'll get another series of four compounds, and this is the compounds that we talk about. This is CBG, THC, CBD, and CBC, right? So all together, these are eight major cannabinoids present in a plant. Uh, two more are being produced mostly during the processing of the hemp material and hemp oil, and they are called 8-THC, right? It's an isomer of 9-THC. It also has some activities, but it's not as potent. And also CBN, which is basically oxidation form of THC, and it has completely different properties. Right? So these two compounds are almost not present in a plant in its natural state and only appear in the extracts when they are being processed. And then finally, the plant is smart. It uses a different acid, which is called cannabigenerobarinic acid, CBGVA, to create exactly the same series compound on the other side. That's it. These are the all cannabinoids that you should care about. There are the rest hundred of them. I mean, let them be there, but at least for now, nobody cares. Uh, when we produce different breeds of cannabis plants, when we produce different products from cannabis, right, the important part about it is testing, right? So we want to measure and quantify and know exactly what's found in the plant or in its products, right? So it's very easy to do. Uh, my lab is certified to receive the hemp samples and run the analysis. And basically we use HPLC, which is no heat system, so it doesn't break down the acid forms of cannabinoids. So we can quantify correctly both the acid form and the active form, right? And then, I mean, it looks pretty much something like this. Remember I told you these are the all cannabinoids that matter? Here they are. And if you look, there is pretty much not a single other peak showing up on a chromatogram, which means all other cannabinoids, all the other 100 cannabinoids that you heard about, they are here in a baseline. And this is pretty much the major chemical composition of the plant. All right, so, I mean, just for the curiosity, I'll show you the distribution of cannabinoids in a plant, right? Because, I mean, plants are different, especially hemp. You have a male plant, you have a female plant. Uh, you have roots, you have stems, you have leaves, you have flowers. So the question is, are all these oils produced from different parts, same or not? Uh, do they have difference in cannabinoid profiles and how much? So this is just a quick runoff. Uh, this graph here basically shows you the log scale of total cannabinoids present in root, stem, leaf, and flower, right? So flowers, and we all know about it, have the highest amount of cannabinoids. Leaves have a lot of it, but because of the chlorophylls and other things, it's not that easy to purify oil and other bioactive principles from the leaves. Stems have a very significant amount of cannabinoids. Roots have hardly anything, okay? This analysis was done on CBD type of hemp plant. So this is plant which was designed, which was bred to produce half level of CBDs. So if you look about it, uh, I mean, you look at the basically roots, stems, leaves, 
and these are the flowers, you will see the green circle, this is CBD. So the plant is basically putting all its energy and all its mechanism, all the enzymes, to produce CBD at the expense of THC, right? There is some THC present in the roots. Proportionally, it's significant. Quantities, it's tiny. Uh, but then if you look to other parts, the proportion of THC goes down with every single step, right? So these are the stalks, these are the leaves, and these are the flowers. So basically, it's a classical CBD plant, right? So if you are looking for a chemotype, right? If you're looking for a plant because CBD is your target, that's what you want to take, make sure it's come from the plant which was engineered, right? Bred, it doesn't have to be genetically engineered, which was bred to produce mostly the chemotypes that you're interested in. Uh, all right, so now let's switch the topic and s ask a question why we are talking about it, right? I mean, plants produce chemicals, they, they don't care about us, they have to survive in the environment, they have the roots, they cannot run, so they use them to fight off everybody. By chance, by pure chance, these compounds also interact with our endocannabinoid system, right? It just happens that the chemical structure, which is you know, the major structure of the cannabinoid, fits into the receptors which human body has. And Basically, our endocannabinoid system consists of three major parts. So there are two major receptors, CB1 and CB2. Uh, there are other receptors, some of them postulated to recognize cannabinoids. Some of them have been shown to recognize the cannabinoid a little bit. But 90% of solid science that was done on endocannabinoid work comes from CB1 and CB2 receptor. There are enzymes which take the ligands take the molecules which bind to these receptors, and they basically chop them, right? So they degrade the signal rather than change the activity of the receptor. And this way, they regulate how much of the signal is actually transferred to the receptor and transferred to the cell. And then uh, finally, well, and the signal itself, it's what we call the endogenous cannabinoid, right? Our bodies are very smart, so our bodies are producing molecules which interact both with CB1 and CB2 receptors. So all together, you have a, like a three-part system, right? You have the endocannabinoid, the natural molecules which are produced by your bodies, which are recognized by the cannabinoid receptors, and being metabolized by ECS enzymes. The system is very complex, right? Because you see that you can change the amount of the signal, you can change the amount of the receptor, or you can change the rate at which it's metabolized and change the balance of endocannabinoid system. Two major receptors, CB1 and CB2, they are closely related, but I mean, to a certain degree, they are 60 to 70% overlapping sequence. The major difference between the receptors is their distribution. CB1 is primarily located in a central nervous system, right? So this is different parts of our brain, uh, while CB2 is mostly located on the immune cells, which are found in the peripheral parts of our bodies, or in the immune nerve cells, or, or uh, for GI tract, spleen, uh, organs of that nature, right? I always say predominantly and mostly, right? Because as our techniques improve, as our methods improve, we start finding CB1 systems on the periphery, uh, CB1 receptors on the periphery of the body, and we start finding CB2 receptors in the brain, right? But the major balance is still there. CB1, central nervous system, CB2, outside in the rest of the body. Because of this different distribution, they also have different function, right? So CB1 receptors are mostly affecting central regulation of your appetite. They are affecting central regulation of your anxiety, of your sleep, uh, of your food intake, uh, pain. While the peripheral receptors, so the receptors which are outside in the rest of your body, are mostly involved in the regulation of inflammatory and uh, uh, peripheral pain processes, bone mass accumulation, things of that nature, right? So it's not really the structure of the receptor that is that much different. It's the function and the distribution of receptor which is very, very critical. And by the way, interesting fact, cannabinoid receptors are the most abundant receptors in the human body. Interesting, right? So if you take all total receptors in all human body, cannabinoids will come up as number one by numbers. 
So if we have so many of them, the question is, they probably play a very important role. Uh, these are the two ligands. These are the compounds which we naturally produced, right? The, the one on the left is called anandamide. The one on the right is called 2-AG. And these are the molecules which are producing from fatty acid derivatives. And they are the one which are lipophilic, which means they don't like water too much, but they spread across the lipid bilayers very quickly. They target the receptors, they interact with the receptors, and they cause the signal to be transduced inside of the cell. Um, what enzymes do, I told you, they chop it, right? So for example, here, if you look at anandamide, which has the arachidonic acid as its main structure, and then ethanolamine, which is uh, attached to the molecule, right? So basically, the enzyme comes and chops it right here, right? It releases arachidonic acid from the endocannabinoid, and this way, makes it inactive. Uh, and then, you see, the system is complex, right? There are many different pulls and pull, push, push and pull uh, situations, and the receptors are everywhere, which means, most likely, they are playing some kind of homeostatic role, right? They're trying to keep many systems in our body in check. Um, since we know that receptors are different, right? When we discovered all this 15 years ago, 20 years ago, some pharmaceutical companies said, well, great. Now that we have a target, we can develop a drug which specifically targets this target and has beneficial effects, right? So CB1 affects our food intake. We know that CB1 signaling is upregulated in a metabolic states of obesity and diabetes. So then, even though it's not easy, they spent five, eight years, they went through the pharmacological and medicinal chemistry screening, they found the molecules which specifically target CB1 receptor with the idea if we can shut down CB1 receptor, we'll have all these benefits of decreased food intake and improved metabolic health. Okay, so, so this molecule was created. It went through the all stages of approval. It became a drug in Europe. Never was approved in US for one very strong reason, right? Selective pharmacology of cannabinoid receptors is dangerous. If you really shut down one of the receptor signaling, you bring up a lot of side effects, right? Because they're involved in so many things. So that's exactly what happened. The people who were taking the drug have major problem with anxiety and psychosis. They ate less, they lost weight. They felt great. Unfortunately, it didn't last because the mood, anxiety, and psychosis set in with time, right? So then the question is, if selective targeted pharmacology of these receptors is not that appealing, is there any other approach that we can take to address this issue? And basically, if you're thinking about CB1 and CB2, you always have to think about the balance, right? So from one side, you have CB2 working on bone loss, inflammation, and basically peripheral pain. On one side, you have CB1, which is food metabolic metabolism and depressive disorders, right? You don't want to really upregulate or shut down too much, but what you want to try to do is to shift the balance, right? So for a healthy person, it's probably irrelevant, right? You have your balance in check, you feel happy, you wake up every day full of energy. But for the person who is off, for whatever reason, this becomes critical, right? If you can selectively play on changing the activity CB1 with CB2 receptor, and I put here an arbitrary numbers, you know, I mean, I like the 80-20 rule, so I say, you know, if you manage to upregulate CB2 and downregulate CB1 to 80-20%, right? An arbitrary number, I mean, don't quote me on that. But you, you get the idea, right? The nutritional interventions that you want to try to apply, you want to change the balance of activity between the two receptors to steer it into the beneficial outcome. All right, some dietary interventions which can help you do that. Uh, you heard two previous talks, amazing talks, on polyunsaturated fatty acids, right? Omega-3s, omega-6. I mean, we know that our diets are completely off from what they used to be. The ratio of these Acids, the target ratio two to one, now they say three to one, four to one, because they cannot ever get to two to one. That's what we eat right now, right? 
So with that in mind, I mean, how many of you actually realize what Omega-6 is, what Omega-3 is, how they're connected? I mean, it's so complicated, right? Everybody saw these names, but what's behind it, right? This is a password, you cannot see it. But I'll, <laughs> but I'll blow it up step by step, and I'll spend exactly two minutes to explain it to you. Okay, so these are the fatty acids, which, I mean, I think you see it better than I do. Uh, so these are the most typical fatty acids which are pl present in your bloodstream. Uh, palmitic acid being the most common one. This is the one that you get a lot from the diet if you eat high fat food. Also if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, so you have excess carbohydrate, a lot of sugars are being converted through the Krebs cycle into the palmitic acid as well. What our bodies do, they introduce a single double bond. So you, you, you see it's a saturated fatty acid. We introduce a single double bond into this molecule, and it becomes monounsaturated fatty acid, okay? We are very efficient at it. As long as you get enough of this in your diet, you'll make plenty of this. This is palmet palmitoic acid, which is basically unsaturated version of palmitic acid. Uh, and what happened next, right? We don't have the enzymes to go to the next step, right? So if you wanted to create a poorly unsaturated fatty acid, which means you want to introduce the second double bond, basically twitch the molecule even more, right? So you have one twist here, and now you, have, you will start having two, right? You see right here and right here. So linoleic and alpha linolenic acid, we cannot do it. And most animals can't, right? So we have to get these from the dietary source. And dietary source is plants. Plants are pretty, well, algae, it's pretty much the only one who has the enzymes to do the step. So how do we get it from fish oil, you ask me, right? Well, fish eat a lot of algae and get the essential fatty acids from there. And then we get it from fish. So you, you, you see the chain, right? Uh, once we get the essential fatty acid, right? We cannot make them, but we can get them through diet. We know what to do with them next. So, okay, if you look at the bottom, fatty acid, which is linoleic acid, right? Uh, basically what we do, it's right here. We create another double bond, making a gamma linoleic acid out of it, and a series of fatty acids which end up in arachidonic acid, right? So we keep introducing double bonds into the molecule until we end up with one, two, three, four, four double bonds, and the first double bond is on a six carbon well, oh, sorry, the first double bond is on the six carbon from the end of the molecule. That's why it's omega-6, okay? So if you go back and look at the top acid, which is alpha-linolenic acid, we can take it up, use pretty much the same enzymes to go through a very similar series of reactions to synthesize EPA, and at very little efficiency. Our bodies are not that efficient to do the last couple of steps, but we still do them. Uh, about one, two percent. You can also synthesize your own DHA, which are omega-3 acids. Makes sense, right? Well, the interesting part about it, that endocannabinoids, right, the, the thing that we're talking about it, are produced from arachidonic acid. So they are produced from the omega-6 pathway. So even that the omega-6 pathway is the inflammatory pathway, right, and it leads to the production of a lot of metabolites when, as Jess said, as John said, I drive inflammation forward, right? They are also very critical for producing endocannabinoids. And the interesting part is when you break down endocannabinoids, you release the arachidonic acid back into the system and it can be either stored in the membranes or can be used to drive the inflammation. That's how endocannabinoid system and inflammatory system are related. They are basically a part of the same fatty acid biosynthesis pathway, okay? I, I, hope, I, ho I hope it was clear enough. Uh, EPA and DHA by themselves don't interact very well with cannabinoid receptors. However, they can be picked up by the same enzymes which work on arachidonic acid, and they can be changed to their ethanolamine forms, and those ethanolamine forms actually do interact with the receptors. Again, everything comes together. All right, uh, Sarah mentioned hemp oil as a vehicle for cannabinoids, right? And it's very interesting because hemp, oil, hemp plant 
is one of the quite unusual plants, which has a very favorable fatty acid profile for us. So if you look at the ratio of omega-6 threes, it actually stays in that one to three to one to four range, not exactly one to two as we wanted it to be, but it's one of the closest plants that you can have, one of the closest plant-based oils that fits that ratio, right? So most of the hemp oil, if you see, it will be linoleic acid, which is omega-6, then a very significant proportion of alpha linoleic and stereodonic acid, which are omega-3s, and then a small amount of saturated fatty acids, stearic and palmitic, and small amounts of monounsaturated fatty acids, which is the oleic acid right here. So not only cannabinoids themselves, but hemp oil as a vehicle is actually quite beneficial for cannabinoid system. All right, uh, several other botanical interventions which are known to interact with cannabinoid receptors. I mean, this is probably more fun than science. Tuyon, it's a compound which is isolated from Artemisia, and originally, like when they made the absent oat style in French, the absent was very high in this compound, okay? Uh, it is known to interact with cannabinoid receptors, both CB1 and CB2, and it's very interesting because in US, the addition of Tuyon to food is not permitted. Basically, all the products which are produced in the U.S., they are regulated to contain less than 10 milligrams per liter of Tuyon, right? That's why absinthe was prohibited for a very long time in the U.S. until they modified the process and they got these numbers right. The interesting thing is that at the same time, sage oil, which is about 50% Tuyon, is on FDA listed grass. Go figure. Uh, Another interesting compound which interacts with cannabinoid receptors is yanganin. It comes from a kava plant. Kava plant is a plant which is found mostly in Polynesian islands. It has very interesting history. It's a sterile plant, right? So it cannot reproduce by itself. So early humans, whenever they found it, they basically keep propagating it by cutting it. It's a mutant. So every single kava plant in Polynesia, starting from Hawaii all the way down to New Zealand, it's exactly the same plant. They loved it so much that they took it from island to island to island as they traveled until they got to New Zealand. New Zealand is too cold, so when they brought kava plants to New Zealand, they didn't grow there. So what they did, they found another plant called a kava, and now there is a kava in New Zealand which has nothing to do with the original kava. Uh, Another interesting, another interesting example of the compounds which are found in a diet which interact with the receptors is this compound which is called fal falcarinol. It's a lipophilic compound found in carrot oil and it's known to specifically inactivate CB1 receptor without any significant effects on CB2. So basically carrots, which are accessible to everybody, is one of the easiest way to try to shift the balance and try to suppress the activation of CB1 receptor a little bit without affecting CB2 that much. Uh, and then finally, probably the most famous example is alkylamides, which are present in echinacea. Uh, they've been described, these molecules being described as uh, quite potent agonists of both CB1 and CB2 receptor, mostly CB1, of course. Um, my last example is beta cariophyllene. Uh, some of you probably know this compound coming from the black pepper, but very few people realize that beta cariophyllene is one of the major terpenes found in hemp. It is one of the main, like there is mercetin, which is more abundant, but then beta cariophyllene is second or third major terpene found in hemp, and it's known to interact with cannabinoid receptors as well. So here for you is a very interesting example when plant develop two different chemical structures, completely unrelated. Cannabinoids and terpenes are different biochemical classes of the compounds, which are both, for whatever reason it needed to, designed to target cannabinoid receptors. Uh, finally, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's nice to talk all about it, but how can we prove, right, how we can quantify these activities and say, yes, these compounds and these extras do work on cannabinoid receptors. 
It's relatively easy if you ask me. Uh, all you need to do, right, is you have to have a very carefully selected model system. Because cannabinoid receptors are so abundant, they're pretty much present everywhere. And a lot of cells will have both different ratios. So you never know what you're working with, right? So you, ha you have to have an engineered cell, which is depleted of the endogenous cannabinoid receptors, has zero cannabinoid receptors. And then you specifically introduce either cannabinoid receptor one or cannabinoid receptor two. So you have two different cell lines expressing either CB1 and CB2. Then you can challenge them with your bioactives of interest, your oils, your extract, your whole food uh, interventions, and see what happens, right? Whenever they activate the receptor, there are signals that go through, and there is some very easy read out where you actually see the cells lighting up because of the calcium flux. You can see the cells lighting up as a measure of the response to the cannabinoid receptor. So if you do studies like this, I mean, this is just some preliminary data that I want to share with you. If you look at the hemp oil compared to hemp oil combinations with EPA, DHA, or, or CBD alone, you see that hemp oil and combinations of hemp oil with EPA, DHA are one of the stronger activators, both of CB1 and CB2 receptors, but geared towards CB2. So remember, I'm talking about the balance, right? So hemp oil is probably one of the easiest dietary intervention to try to shift that balance on CB1 and CB2 receptor to get the desired activity. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, so with that, I would like to stop and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you.